Hi everyone, welcome to the video two of Audit and Assurance F8 Crash Course for ACCA December 23 exams. Uh, as part of video one, I had discussed regarding the assurance engagement, what are the elements of the assurance engagement, and I started with the audit process. How do you obtain an audit? How do you accept an audit? What are the criteria that you have to look at? And uh, the basics, like starting process of the audit. So I had uh, discussed regarding the audit strategy, understanding the entity, and then based on your understanding, how will you find out the risky areas? Uh, I was had elaborated regarding the audit risk, and I ended up with the materiality level. Okay, now uh, I had also provided the link for the materiality video in the description of video one. So you have, if you have not watched it, do watch it. You will get a clarity on materiality and performance materiality. Now, video two will be the continuation of video one. So I'm going to basically start from the audit planning here. So as part of the audit plan, we had discussed audit strategy first. Let me share the screen. Okay. So as part of the audit plan, we had discussed first thing is audit strategy. So you're going to formulate the audit strategy, which is nothing but the overall approach for the audit. Okay, now once you have formulated the audit strategy, you are going in depth with the audit plan. You're going to implement the audit strategy. So audit This was the overall approach that you have formulated. Now we are going to implement the audit strategy. Okay, so this is going to be the formulation of audit plan. So now under this audit plan, what are the things we are going to see basically? We are going to look at the scope we are actually going to plan regarding the scope of the audit and timing and direction of the audit so as part of the audit plan we are going to look at the scope timing and direction of the audit what is basically the scope of the audit what is it concerned about what it is basically you're going to do see scope is where you're going to decide upon uh, for example, uh, what is the uh, scale of the audit? You're going to establish the scale of the audit that you're going to carry out for the client company. For example, there are multiple locations in which the client company is operating. Okay, so it has multiple locations within the city or uh, it has different locations in different states of the country. Then you have to carry out the audit in different locations. So you're going to look at what is the scale of the audit that I have to perform. So that is the scope. Now coming to audit timing. So this audit timing, you will have to look at different things like, for example, deadlines. If there are any deadlines and uh, when do you have any meetings or when it is going to be a final review of the audit, okay? Deadlines are related to the client will be giving you a deadline or a date within which you have to complete the process of audit. Okay, so you have to make sure you have to discuss with the client regarding what is the deadline for the audit. Then if you're going to have some meetings either from the start till the end, what are the different meetings you're going to have and uh, what are the dates and time and location of those meetings, right? So that's going to be the meeting dates you have to you have to form decide upon the timing of all the audit carried out the deadlines of it and any meetings and what is the end uh what is the time period at which you have to carry out a review of the audit okay so now not only this audit timing has a lot more to understand now when coming to audit timing separately I am taking 1 April as the financial statements start period and 31 March of the next year as the completion. That is the year end for the financial statement. Okay, so here the financial statements begin and the financial statements end. 
Okay, so this is my client financial statement period. Now I'm going to audit the financial statements of the client from 1 April to 31 March of the next year. I have to plan a visit before I start the audit. Okay, so that is when the year has begun, the financial year has begun. And now I have to plan a visit before I even think of auditing. Okay, this is because I need to understand the systems, processes, and the practices of the organization. Uh, for example, even the locations. Okay, so I need to plan a visit. So I need to plan for a timing of that as well. When can I plan a visit to the location of my client so that I can understand the processes, systems, and practices within the organization? Now, if this is not my new client, okay, suppose this is a client uh, which I've been working for more than two years. Now, I very well know the systems and processes, so I can directly go for an audit. But still, you have to plan a visit before you start an audit because there could be some kind of changes in the systems, processes, and practices, okay? Or otherwise, there could also be, if there are multiple locations for my client, then there could be some changes in the locations. Uh, maybe new additional locations, the shop or the factory, uh, they would have expanded in different locations or they would have shut down certain units as well. So there are possibilities for many changes that could happen in a, in a year right so i have to plan a visit before i start the audit okay so this can be once the financial year begins i can plan for a visit then before i carry out, i plan for a final audit i need to make sure i have carried out an interim audit interim audit is in between the financial year for example it's uh the year that i have taken is 1 april to 31 march so in between in the sense it could be uh 1 october or even november they carry out a half yearly it's nothing but a half yearly audit it's called interim audit okay so basically the necessity for this interim audit is to understand the efficiency of the internal controls in the efficiency and effectiveness of the internal controls in the organization why see uh, i had told in video one regarding the audit approach so uh, the audit approach is that if the internal controls in the organization which i'm going to audit are effective and efficient enough i can rely on the work of the client so my scope, that is the substantive procedures that I have to perform will go down. I can perform less substantive procedures and I can come to a conclusion. But whereas if the internal controls are not effective and efficient in the organization, which I'm going to audit, can I rely on the work of the client? No, obviously no. So I have to plan to perform more of substantive procedures. So that's the reason if all these processes have to be done at the end during the final audit process, it would be a very big uh, process and it would be time taking, right? So in order to eliminate all those kind of um, things like time uh, consumption and uh, bigger processes, we have an interim audit in between. Here we do all the test of controls, like we test the controls in the organization. We come to a conclusion regarding the internal controls, whether it is high or whether it is low. Okay, so we come to a conclusion on effectiveness and efficiency of the internal controls, both the design of the internal controls and its implementation. And then we will have a conclusion. And so during this period, I can plan for my final audit. So based on this, uh, for example, I come to a conclusion that internal controls are very low in the organization in which I'm going to audit. Now, during this period, I can plan how much of substantive procedures are needed, what are the audit procedures I have to perform. So I can very well go to the year end with a correct plan for my final audit. Right? So that is the reason why we need this interim audit. Now, 
uh, 31 March is the financial year end. So my financial statements, the client's financial statements are ready for the audit. After the year end, I'll fix a date for the final audit. Okay. So this final audit will be after the year end. Here, basically, I'm going to carry out substantive procedures and I'll be obtaining sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Sufficient appropriate audit evidence is with respect to both the quality and quantity of the evidence that you're going to obtain. Right? I'll be discussing that in detail in this video. Now, substantive audit, uh, sorry, we are going to uh, obtain sufficient appropriate evidence and you're going to conclude on the financial statements. That is, you're going to provide an opinion, audit opinion on the financial statements of the client. Okay. I think so far it's clear. So this is the audit plan totally. So first of all, we had come to a con uh, overall approach of the audit. That is, we formulated an audit strategy. Okay. Then once we had the audit strategy in hand, we will implement the audit strategy. That is, you're going to make an audit plan where you will be deciding upon the scope of the audit and the timing and direction of the audit. Now, once we have obtained the evidence, we are going to make the audit documentation, okay? And then the process will continue as review and reporting. Uh, let us go to audit documentation, review and reporting at the last. Before that, we have two broad concepts that we have to discuss regarding the internal controls and substantive procedures, okay? So first coming to the internal controls. So now, what is an internal control? Why do we need it? Basically, controls are, in simple words, we can say these are the techniques that could uh, that are being implemented so that you can reduce the uh, risk of misstatements or fraud in the systems and processes within the organization. So basically, for your understanding, internal controls are the processes that are designed and implemented, which are being managed by those charged with governance and the management people. So these are being designed and implemented and being managed by those charged with governance in order to provide a reasonable assurance on the three things, that is reliability of the financial statements or reporting and uh, effectiveness of the operations and the compliance with laws and regulations. Hope you understood. These are the processes which are being designed and implemented and maintained by the uh, management or those charged with governance to provide a reasonable assurance on these three things. Why are we going to provide reasonable assurance on these three things? Because you need reliability over the financial reporting uh, system that they have used so that the financial statements will be free from material misstatements. Then if only when the processes are operating effectively without any kind of fraud and you have proper controls in place, you will not be having any problem in the financial statements. There will not be any material risk. Okay, So you need to be uh, sure that the operations have proper controls. They have been, uh, controls have been designed and implemented appropriately so that the operations could be effective. And then you should make sure they comply with the laws and regulations. Okay. So this is what is the basic idea of these internal controls. Now, uh, one important point that has to be remembered is as an auditor, we are going to evaluate 
the internal controls over the financial reporting. So what does this basically mean? Are we uh, concerned about the accuracy of the amounts or only regarding the system of preparation of the financial statements? I'll repeat the question. We are going to evaluate the internal controls over the financial reporting. As an auditor, are we concerned about uh, the accuracy of the amounts or the system of preparation of the financial statements? So when as an auditor, we are going to look at the internal controls in the organization, we are not concerned about the accuracy of the amounts as of the controls are concerned. Okay, so here we are not going to look at the accuracy. When it comes to substantive procedures, accuracy is one assertion where we have to check whether the values are correct. That is with regard to substantive procedure. But here we are uh, looking at the controls. So we are concerned about the system of preparation of the financial statements and not the accuracy of the amounts. Okay, so this is one important point that has to be remembered when you think of the internal controls. Okay. Now, coming to the next thing, we have seen what is internal control and what is the important point that you have to remember regarding the internal controls. Now, the most important part is the components of internal control. Okay, so they have been divided into five things. First one is the Control environment. So what is a control environment? It's nothing but the structure and um, the culture of the organization, we can say, okay? The structure and the culture of the organization has to be designed in a way that uh, they encourage higher extent of internal controls in the organization. So the company in which I'm going to audit, it has to have a control environment which has a higher extent of implementing internal controls in its processes and procedures. Okay. It means if at all it has some recruitment procedures, training procedures, then it has to, to a higher extent, have internal controls over it. So that is called control environment. Second one is risk assessment process. So there can be no company that does not have any risk. So if at all there are some material risk, what, uh, how will the management be assessing those risks? Okay, so this is relating to how the management will be able to assess the risk. If at all that material risk arises, uh, what could be the likelihood of it in having an impact on the organization, okay? And if at all it arises and it has a very uh, great impact on the organization, how will the management address regarding that issue? So this is the risk assessment process. Third one is information system. So this relates to uh, some kind of like manual or electronic procedures for recording and processing the transactions, okay? The third one, uh, yeah, this is third one. Fourth one is control activities. These are the most important things that you need to remember. Control activities, basically, these are the techniques which has to be implemented in an organization uh, relating to its processes, systems, and practices so that you can uh, reduce the material risk to a lower level, okay? So what... Can you think of some control activities that has to be implemented in an organization? For example, if there are going to be some kind of payments, okay, there should be approval and authorization by a higher authority before any payments could be made. So that is one kind of a control activity. I'm just giving small examples, okay. When segregation of duty, For example, there is a person who is going to account for all the transactions um, and then um, you are going to make a payment. For example, it's related to asset. The person who has the custody of the asset has to be separate from the person who records the transactions and from the person who authorizes any payment and uh, approves for the purchase of the asset 
okay so there should be segregation of all the duties because if uh, why is segregation of duty needed if one person is going to have all the uh, responsibilities in his hand then there is a possibility of uh, fraudulent activities being incurred right so we need a segregation of duties then you can think of physical controls for example you can have some passwords for a locker or for a room where you have a, a confidential documents you have you can have a physical lock with passwords and you can have cctv footage cameras okay so these kind of physical controls are also possible then you can also have computer system controls or call the IT controls, okay? So this computer system controls can be then divided into general IT controls and application controls. See, general IT controls are normally for the entire IT environment. For example, it could be uh, having an antivirus program or backup plan. Uh, and then you can also have some passwords. Okay, so these are all general IT controls. Application control is relating to the integrity of the accounting records. For example, um, whether the transactions have been accurately and properly uh, processed and recorded as of these computer system controls are concerned. So that is the application controls and general IT control differences. So these are normally the control activities. Then the last one will be monitoring the controls. There are a lot more control activities. Even if you remember the bank reconciliation statements that we have done in FR, um, it is like the cash book bank balance is going to be reconciled with the bank statement to know what are the differences. If at all some differences arise, we have to look at what could be the reasons behind it. Uh, either there is a timing difference uh, or if there is any amount difference, any wrong transaction have been recorded. Okay. So we will be looking all that. So these are all control activities. There are a lot more. Now, the last one, monitoring controls. Once you have the controls in place, you need to monitor it, whether they are operating appropriately, right? One thing that has to be monitored, two things that has to be monitored is whether it has been appropriately designed in order to prevent and detect that particular risk. Then, uh, with regard to the implementation, whether uh, the reason why I have implemented this, whether the way in which I wanted it to work, it is working in that appropriate way or not. That also I have to look at. So this is going to check both the effectiveness and efficiency of the control. So who is going to monitor all these controls, whether it is operating effectively and efficiently? It will be the management, that is the supervisor or a person assigned uh, for example, the audit committee. And there is also a possibility that internal audit department is also there within the client firm. So they also have the responsibility to monitor the controls. Okay. Now that you know all the control activities that are in place, okay, now you have to... Um, do the test of controls, whether the controls are operating effectively, whether the design and implementation are efficiently and effectively operating. Okay, so how will you carry out a test of controls? So basically, the next thing that I'm going to do is test of controls. What are the ways in which I can test whether the controls are operating effectively? I can inquire I can make an inquiry with the management and uh, the internal audit team to know how far the controls are in place and how far it is efficient and effective. Then I can do an inspection. Of inspection is normally uh, if there are some physical assets, I can inspect the asset uh, directly or I can inspect the documents. Okay, then. 
I can also observe. I can, for example, there is a process uh, which I can observe. I can ask the client to uh, do a, uh, the process testing. That is, I can do it on a live basis. I can make the client do the process and observe process to conclude whether the controls are in place. I can also re-perform the process by my own okay, to know whether the controls are in place. Now that I have done the test of controls finally i come to a conclusion that internal controls are either uh, good or bad okay now what will i do i have to report on these internal controls right to the management so i will be providing a management letter or a letter of weakness So this is nothing but it will be providing uh, the management with details on what are the uh, controls that were deficient, okay? What are the deficiencies? What uh, impact or implications that could have and how the problems could be solved. So that's what I'll be reporting on, okay? So this is relating to the internal controls that we have to remember. And before going on to substantive procedures, now once, yes, the test of controls are done and uh, I know what is the extent of internal controls. So based on this, I'm going to decide my substantive procedures. So how far, how, what is the extent of substantive procedures I have to perform in order to obtain the audit evidence. Now, before going that, I want you to remember this um, important points. As an auditor, who is going to perform the audit over internal controls over the financial reporting. What are the things we have to remember? First thing that we will do is understand the components of the internal controls. Sorry. Uh, understand the components, okay? understand the components of internal controls of the client. And then second one is they will be having different processes. Okay, so once we have understood the components of internal controls, we have to document the systems. Uh, that is, for example, there is a process. You have some purchases going on in the company. Okay, they purchase a raw material from the suppliers and uh, that purchase goes till the payment. Okay. So this purchase till payment, this process, what is the um, process involved? How, uh, how many approvals does it go through? And what are the stages of this purchase till the payment in this particular organization? We have to understand the system and then document those systems. This is just one example. You have lots of systems like processes going on in a company. So you have to document all those systems. So this documenting can uh, be in the form of flowcharts, okay, or narrative notes, or even questionnaires, okay. So once you have uh, documented the systems, the third thing that you're going to do is test the controls. Remember, testing of controls is for testing the design and implementation, effectiveness and efficiency, both the design and implementation of the controls. Okay, so whether they are effective and efficient. So that is an important point that has to be remembered. Then once that is done, you're going to report on the internal controls. So all these things were the ones we were looking at now like before okay so you're going to report on the internal controls to the management once that is done you will be deciding on the extent of substantive procedures that i have to perform further right so these are the complete things you need to remember regarding the internal controls okay now going on with uh, the next technique 
that is the substantive procedure next big topic substantive procedures before moving on to that i wanted to discuss one more concept that you have to remember that is called the computer assisted audit technique it is also in short called caat cat okay so this is nothing but uh this is a technique that is going to help you increase the effectiveness and efficiency of the audit. For example, in the beginning, I had told if there are thousands of transactions, we will not be able to um, audit all the thousands of transactions. We will be just taking samples, for example, 40 or 50 samples we are going to audit. But with use of this technique, uh, if we set a particular criteria and then we can even audit thousands of complex transactions based on those criteria. okay this has two components that is audit program or uh, it is also called audit software or a test data so these two techniques can be used to audit uh, complex transactions which could increase the efficiency and eff effectiveness of your audit so this audit program is normally to examine and interrogate with the client's accounting data. So basically, this is concerned with examining the accounting data. Okay. Test data, whereas test data is relating to um, testing the client programs. For example, there is a process where you can input some dummy data as an auditor and then you can test whether the client program is operating effectively and efficiently. Okay, so that is called test data, whereas audit program is relating to examining and interrogating with the counting data. This is relating to the accuracy of the counting data. Okay, so this is computer or assisted audit technique in simple words. Okay. Next, I'm going to move on to the substantive procedures, which is also a very important topic before moving on to the audit documentation. Now, substantive procedures are performed in order to detect the material misstatements at the assertion level. So basically, we are going to confirm the amounts and disclosures in the financial statements. Okay. Now, when it comes to the assertion level, uh, we should think of two uh, particular areas. That is, assertions can be based on two items. That is, PNL items or the SOFP items. Okay. So, when it is concerned with the PNL items, these are called the class of transaction. Okay, and when it is concerned with the SOFP, that is statement of financial position, it is called account balances and disclosures. So what are the assertions that we are going to look at as a part of substantive procedures? With regard to PNL items, that is a class of transactions, first thing that we will be looking at is occurrence. Occurrence is nothing but whether this transaction or an event that we are going to record has actually occurred or not. Okay. Second one is completeness. So whether the transactions and events that I'm going to record has been completely recorded. That is completeness. First one is whether the transactions that I'm recording has actually occurred and once I'm going to record whether I'm completely recording all the transactions. Third one is accuracy. Whether accurate amount has been recorded. Okay. Uh, then you have cutoff. Cutoff is normally PNL items. We are going to audit all those transactions that have uh, incurred during that period. 
count balances is where it's going to be end of the period. So this is during the period and this is end of the period. So cutoff meaning is that whether the transactions that have occurred that I'm recording, I'm going to record in the correct period or not. Okay, so that is cutoff. So this cutoff and occurrence is relevant only in the PNL items. I'll come back to that again. Now, cutoff is whether I'm going to record the transactions in the correct period or not. Then the third one is classification. Sorry, fifth one is classification. And the last one, presentation. So classification is it again, whether I'm going to cl um, classify that particular transaction uh, and uh, report it in appropriate account. Then presentation is with respect to the disclosures. If there are some transactions that have to be disclosed, whether I have presented appropriately, whether I have disclosed it appropriately, right? So when it is concerned with the classes of transactions, that is uh, audit for that complete period, we are going to look at the assertions of occurrence, completeness, accuracy, cutoff, classification, and presentation. Now, when it comes to SOFP, we are going to look at assertions like first one is existence. So what are the things we will be looking at when it comes to an SOFP item? That is asset, liability, and equity. So whether does these assets, liability, equity exist? That is what existence is about. Second one will be rights and obligation. So when will you look at for the rights and obligation? For example, if it is concerned about the asset, whether you have the um, rights to hold and control the asset, then that is this rights. And obligation is with related to liability. If a liability has been recorded, whether you definitely have an obligation towards it. So that is called rights and obligation. Then you have uh, accuracy again here also. But with this, you have two more things called valuation and allocation. So accuracy is regarding whether the amount that you have recorded, the transaction that you have recorded is accurate and valued appropriately as per the financial reporting standards and allocated appropriately. Okay, so these are the three things you will be looking at. Then completeness, whether you have recorded all the complete transactions and whatever has incurred. And then again, the classification and presentation. So classification is to know whether the transactions have been appropriately recorded in the correct respective accounts. And presentation is to um, disclose all the uh, related disclosures, that, uh, all the disclosures have to be appropriately presented. Okay. So now, one thing that has to be remembered regarding these assertions is this occurrence and cutoff will be there only in the classes of transactions because this is related to the PNL item and rights and obligation and the existence are related only to the account balances. Whereas the accuracy, classification, presentation, completeness will be related to both PNL item and SOFP. Why can you think of what are the reasons why occurrence and cutoff will not come to SOFP and uh, assertions like existence and rights and obligation will not be affecting the class of transactions? See, we are going to uh, look at only the assets, liabilities and equity as of SOFP item. That is the account balances and disclosures are concerned. So that is a year-end item. We are not looking at uh, a transaction that has occurred during the year. This is a year-end item. So we are going to look at whether you have a right and obligation towards the asset and liability that uh, affects your financial statement and whether it actually exists. But when concerned with the class of transactions, you are going to check whether the transactions occur during the period, that period's transaction is counted for in the appropriate accounting period or not. So that is the reason why we are looking at occurrence and cutoff in the classes of transaction, but not in the count balances and disclosure, okay? So this is the audit 
so this will be the period under the audit and this is the period end. Okay. Hope the assertions are clear now. Now I'm moving on with gathering the audit evidence. Okay. Basically, the important things that has to be remembered with respect to audit evidence is the audit evidence has to be sufficient and appropriate. This is what I've been telling right from the start. It has to be sufficient and appropriate. Now, how can you gather an evidence which can be sufficient and appropriate? First of all, the important points that has to be remembered here is that any third party obtain, if you are going to obtain an external um, evidence or a third party evidence, that is better than any evidence that you obtain from the client. Okay. You can obtain the evidence from the client directly, but what is the reliability of those evidence? If your internal controls are very good, then fine. Uh, you can rely on the work of the client. So it is possible that the evidence obtained is also reliable. Otherwise, any third party evidence is better than what you can obtain from the client. As part of the audit, if the auditor could directly obtain an audit evidence, that is more reliable than something obtained from the client. Uh, and other things to remember are if you could obtain an original evidence, it is better than any photocopies and um, oral evidence will not uh, be more of a appropriate one and written evidence is better than the oral evidence, right? This is, these are the points that you have to remember when it comes to sufficiency and appropriateness related to the evidence. Now, how are we going to obtain all this evidence? Like whatever we have discussed relating to the test of controls, we can make an inquiry, we can get confirmations from the external parties. I'll give you an example related to this confirmation shortly, okay? So, inquiry, confirmation. You can also observe, observation, uh, inspection. Here, it's going to be relating to the accuracy of amounts and disclosures, right? So, you can even recalculate or reperform, right? So these are the ways in which you can gather audit evidence. One more important way in which you can gather an audit evidence is the analytical procedures. Analytical procedures, this is where you're going to uh, see the possible relationships between the, you're going to evaluate, okay? You're going to evaluate the probable relationships between the financial and the non-financial data. For example, we have learned all the ratios, right? Accounting ratios. If you're going to calculate the accounting ratios from the financial statements, you can compare it with uh, either the last year's results or budgets or even the industry standards, for example, and then conclude on the trends or changes in the company's financial statements. So this is called analytical procedure. So what are the, this has been, this we will be performing at different stages during the audit. First one will be planning stage. Planning stage, first thing that we will be doing is understanding the entity, right? Now, during the planning stage, when we will be, why we will be doing this analytical procedure is to understand whether the financial statements that we have obtained from the client are consistent with what we have understood regarding the client. Okay. So that is one reason why we perform analytical procedure during the planning stage. And also to identify risky areas. That is one. And second one is to identify the risky areas so that we can allocate the uh, resources appropriately for the audit plan. This is also one reason why we perform the analytical procedures. This is the planning stage. Second stage is substantive procedures stage. This is it again 
to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence, we will be doing the analytical procedures. Last one is final review stage. This one in order to conclude and provide an audit opinion on the financial statements, right? So these are the three stages in which we do analytical procedure. We perform analytical procedures. So gathering audit evidence can be done through all these methods. Fine. Now I'm going with one example which could be uh, helpful for you to understand the substantive procedures and gathering of the audit evidence. That is how to analyze and uh, um, use the assertions. Okay. Now I'm going to take up trade receivables as an example uh, in order to make you understand how to link the assertions uh, and then uh, how to gather the audit evidence. Okay. Now coming to trade receivables. When do you have trade receivables? Trade receivables is based on the credit sales, right? So now, which is the account balance and which is the class of transaction here? First of all, before going on with the assertions, you have to identify which is a class of transaction and which is an account balance. Even in your question, you need to remember, you have to identify whether the given item is a class of transaction or an account balance. Now, trade receivables is an account balance because this is an SOFP item. And what about sales? This is a class of transaction, right? So this is a class of transaction. I'm just writing it in short. So now what are the assertions you can think of for both trade receivables and sales? First of all, going with sales, I can think of accuracy. Whether the sales amount that I have recorded is accurate, okay? Then the other thing, Next thing can be cut off. This is one important assertion when it comes to class of transactions. Whether the sales that have incurred, uh, that have occurred in that particular accounting period have been recorded appropriately in that particular accounting period or not. That is cut off. So I'm going to check for this class of transaction that is sales. I'm going to check the accuracy of the amount recorded, the period in which the sales have been recorded and then uh, yes, completeness whether whatever sales, credit sales have got, whether I've completely recorded it, okay? So these are few assertions which you can link to sales. Then when, come, when it comes to account balances, that is trade receivables, what are the assertions you can think of? Here at again, we can think of accuracy together with the valuation uh, and allocation. Then apart from that, we can think of existence. Uh, we can think of completeness here also. So now when it is concerned with sales, can you think of what is the uh, sales process? First of all, where does the sales process start? You will be having a sales order generated. You will get a sales order from the customer. Okay. Now, once you got the sales order, you will be dispatching those goods, okay? During the goods dispatch, what is the document that will be generated? A goods dispatch note will be generated. And then you will be generating an invoice. And once the invoice has been generated, you will be recording it in the sales day book. you will be recording in sales day book. Then it will be recorded in the receivables ledger. So this is the normal short process, right? From right from sales order, goods dispatch note, invoice, then the recording in sales day book and the receivables ledger. Now, uh, what is, uh, how we are going to link this with this assertions, existence and 
completeness. What is completeness basically? Whatever transaction that has been occurred, have I recorded completely? So now how will I check this? transaction trade receivables in order to check the completeness i have to check right from the sales order whatever sales order i have got whether i have dispatched it invoiced it and whether i have recorded correctly in the receivables ledger so this is completeness okay the completeness check will be going right from the sales order till the receivables ledger existence will be vice versa this is going to be from the sales playbook that is the receivables ledger whatever i have recorded actually did i incur that transaction or not so whatever recorded is in the receivables ledger has been actually incurred or not i'm going to check with the sales order so this is going to be existence the first one going from sales order gdn invoice and then to the receivables ledger is going to check the completeness whatever order i have got whatever transaction i have incurred i have completely recorded Existence is where whatever I have recorded in my receivables ledger, have I actually incurred all that? So that is whether this transaction existed. That is going to check back to the sales order. That is going to be existence. Okay. Now, this is the way in which you can link your assertion. This is the way in which, first of all, you can identify the assertions. So if it's going to be class of transactions, in the question, identify which item you are going to look at. So whether it is an account balance and related disclosure or a class of transaction. Then think of what are the relevant assertions for it. Then go on with the question and then think of how you can link the assertion to those items. Right. Now we have linked the assertions to the trade receivables that is account balances and uh, the P&L items. Okay. Now that's done. How are you going to obtain the audit evidence? Okay, I'll just give one small example relating to it. I told sufficient appropriate audit evidence has to be, uh, first of all, externally obtained. That is third party obtained audit evidence is better than any audit evidence that you have obtained from the client, right? So when trade receivable is concerned, can you think of any third party audit evidence that could be uh got from the client you can get external confirmation external confirmation can be obtained from the customer that is you can um send a query to the customer regarding the amount of the receivables as per the receivables ledger in the client records. So there is a possibility that they can reply to the query that you have asked as a confirmation. They can either say, yes, I agree to the amount as given as per the client's records. Okay, so this is the amount that I have to pay to the client. Or they can even respond with, no, I don't agree to that amount. So this re these responses are from the customer of our client okay so they have sold it to the customer and they have receivables so we are getting an external confirmation from the customers of our client firm now if they had responded yes then it's fine the receivables ledgers amount are correct otherwise they are responding with no i'm not agreeing to an amount and they are telling with any other disputed amount then we have to check where the client's records have gone wrong or they are coming up with some timing differences in recording of transactions or there could uh, even be some errors in the records due to which the customer could respond as no i don't agree to this amount okay so we can get an external confirmation in form of mails or uh, letters through which we are asking them to reply with an s or no regarding the confirmation on the amounts recorded as per receivables if the external confirmation that we have asked we don't get any response no reply has been obtained we have to think of any other sources in which we can contact the uh, third party and then get a response if at all we are not at all getting any external confirmation we can think of alternative procedures for it Okay, so this is the way in which this substantive procedures has to be understood. You have to link the assertions and then 
you have to think of what are the appropriate audit evidence has to be obtained. So your evidence has to be sufficient and appropriate. Now I'm winding up this video with this topic. Uh, in the next video, I'll be discussing the audit documentation, review and report. Thank you.